Hello everyone, welcome to GGN. This is part two for this news bulletin and report today, uh, Thursday, November 29th, 2012. My website is ggnonline.com if you'd like to check that out. Also on YouTube, it's ddarko2012 and ddarko2013. Thank you for joining me everyone, I appreciate it, all your support. Um, we're going to continue here with Syria. Recover. Syrian government finds rare friends in Latin America, says Assad's government doesn't have many allies left in the world, but it's been enjoying support in Latin America this week from leftist leaders who see a fellow challenger to U.S. power in the Middle East counterpart. So they're not all leftist leaders, so there's a, a lot of conservative leaders like in Bolivia and all them uh, areas as well. During uh, trips to Ecuador, Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, Syria's deputy foreign minister received mostly symbolic backing for his government's 20-month battle against the rebels. So this uh, article is kind of um, watering down. Um, I, I don't know, maybe they feel like they're telling the truth. Maybe they are, but I feel like they're just kind of watering it down here um, or downplaying other people or other countries uh, not viewing Syria as uh, a devil country like the United States and Britain and them. So it goes on here and it says, uh, through an interpreter, uh, this Mokad sent Venezuela on Tuesday that he also visited Nicaragua and Cuba. He said those governments had yet to confirm the itinerary. I don't see these states as being particularly pivotal or significant. Um, it also says of the Latin trip, I would see this as a reflection that the regime in Damascus is feeling the heat and is trying to broaden support, which there could be some truth to. What's interesting to note, though, is that Chavez of Venezuela has gone even further than his neighbors to prop up Assad, sending at least three shipments of diesel oil to the Syrian government, which is straining under economic embargoes imposed like sanctions by the U.S. and E.U. Says the aid could provide a real boost to the Assad government. Yeah, so you have to remember, this is coming through this Anthony Skinner, Middle East, North, uh, North Africa chief at the British Risk Analysis. Um, so... Chavez was a vocal supporter of the late Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi and has cultivated ties to Iranian President Ahmadinejad, who has followed a similar itinerary while, says here, mustering Latin America solidarity. When the rest of the world is condemning human rights atrocities there, both Chavez and Bolivian President Evo Morales and even now Ecuadorian President uh, Correa have no qualms about meeting with these people. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, just really whitewashing. I mean, how about the human rights atrocities being carried out in the name of the Western countries that are then funding terrorists? They're funding terrorism, including Turkey, um, and what they're doing here. But uh, in mass graves and, and, and targeting uh, blacks or Christians or whatever minority groups. So, But they don't want to mention that. They don't want to mention that Chavez just won majority vote. I mean, he had most, most uh, real high uh, voter turnout, and he does... I think, support his people the best that they can as far as governments go. Uh, you have Evo Morales, who's also um, in Bolivia, and according to the people down there, they think that he is a better representative of the people, too. He comes from uh, one of the uh, tribes. What draws them together, they say, uh, perhaps is this anti-America or anti-empire is what they should say. This has nothing to do with the American people and voters. Uh, anti-European, anti-Western bias, basically uh, any Rothschild-owned or Zionist-occupied territory. It says, as for Chavez and his allies, there's really nothing they can gain from the relationship other than, you know, me too against the U.S. So they kind of, again, downplay and watering it down. So, but he does have something to gain from it, um, uh, possibly uh, a more peaceful planet without a bunch of terrorists running around uh, in the name of humanitarianism, uh, killing people. And then uh, those same people saying, uh, people that don't want to be for this, oh, well, you're turning a blind eye to human rights abuses. So uh, just pure hypocrisy. Venezuela's uh, Chavez arrives in Cuba for treatment November 28th. So he's back in Cuba uh, doing more uh, cancer therapy. In May, he declared himself free of cancer and it says there's no indication in his letter that the cancer has returned. So... There's a good chance that this is weaponized. And you have McCain Levy openly conspire against world peace, against the will of international community and open defiance of their own contrived international law. American and French warmongers openly plot the destruction of Syria. This is a recent event held by the neocon foreign policy initiative featured conversation with Senator McCain and self-proclaimed philosopher 
uh, this Bernard Henry Levy. Both men played a big role in promoting and arming funding diplomatic recognition of terrorists in Libya who have now overrun much of the country and committed wide-scale atrocities and have left the U.S. ambassador, possibly a CIA uh, head, dead and a U.S. consulate burned to the ground. Despite this, they now openly seek to repeat their success in Syria. So is the video up here, uh, the consequences of inaction in Syria. So this is the foreign policy. This is basically as global as talking about how to take down a sovereign country. It says the consequences uh, are number one, Libya's freedom fighters are verified terrorists. Benghazi, Libya was the epicenter. Number two, these very same terrorists are now being purposefully armed, funded, and funneled into Syria via NATO member Turkey. Three, the violence in Syria is a result of premeditated U.S., Israeli, Saudi, let's not forget Qatari, plan searching back to 2007, confirmed by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Seymour Hersh in his article Redirection. The current rebels in Syria are sectarian driven, genocidal members of the Muslim Brotherhood and Al Qaeda, already subjugating segments of the Syria's population, along with Turkish Syrian border to medieval Saudi inspired uh, autocracy and barbarism. The so called Syrian National Council is run by a Western big oil representative who openly admits he seeks to establish an Islamic state upon the ashes of secular Syria. And worst of all, McCain and Levy admit that the U.S., French, European, and even Turkish people reject wholly the notion of intervention in Syria, as well as the fact that the international community has, on numerous occasions, blocked attempts to approve uh, the intervention or meddling in Syria's internal affairs. Yet the both men and their interests they represent continue to conspire to push the further the conflict at the cost of more lives and at the risk of unraveling regional stability. So for whatever it's worth, who really knows unless you're on the ground there, but uh, Iran's deputy foreign minister says Syrian militants are breathing their last breath. Uh, this follows an article from the 25th, a stalemate in Syria. It says army short on loyalists, and I don't know if that's true, but it says rebels short on guns. The rebels are actually uh, were short, getting short on manpower too. Uh, they were trying to rec recruit uh, defectors, trying to get uh, people to defect from the government. The regime. And this article is kind of surprising to me. Jordan foils bid by militant group to smuggle arms into Syria. The article says Jordanian security forces have uh, thwarted an attempt by a group of militants to smuggle weapons into neighbor neighboring Syria. It says militants load an anti-aircraft machine gun and an armored vehicle in the Syrian town. So yeah, it's uh, they got some sophisticated weapons, and like I said, they're being uh, uh, resupplied over the Turkish border. Then we have Syrian newspaper names 142 dead foreign fighters. Syrian newspaper yesterday published the names of the 142 foreign fighters from 18 countries. The regime said were killed alongside rebels in Syria's conflict. Remember that video I just showed yesterday, was yesterday the day before, of uh, the rebels uh, basically threatening government uh, soldiers that work for the government uh, that they're going to start threatening their families. Well, they were threatening their families and releasing their names or stuff like that. It says here the list was sent to the United Nations Security Council by the Syrian government last month, including Arab, North Africans, Central African, South Asian terrorists, given the date and place of their death. Quote, most are jihadists who belong to al-Qaeda's network or who joined in after arriving in Syria. Among the people named were 47 Saudis, 24 Libyans, 10 Tunisians, 9 Egyptians, 6 Qataris, 5 Lebanese. It also listed 11 Afghans, 5 Turks, 3 Chechens, and a partridge in a pear tree, I guess. Syrian Free Syrian Terrorist Army creates their own police force. So... We already pretty much covered this, but they have their own police force now, and now I guess they have their own network of spies, too. NATO surveying a possible missile site in Turkey. We just heard about this no-fly zone possibly being imposed. Now they're scoping out spots. Last week, Turkey asked its NATO partners to deploy the surface to air Patriot missiles to protect its border with Syria. So the number of batteries, as well as the number of foreign troops needed to operate them, will be decided after vi the visiting team reports back to the Western Military Alliance. On the 21st, NATO Secretary Rasmussen said the alliance would consider the Turkish request without delay. U.S. is weighing bolder effort to intervene in Syria's conflict. In other words, they're going to give them a bunch of cash, possibly direct them, uh, funnel weapons directly to them. So it's basically saying that no real decisions have been made. How they're going to? The Obama regime must uh, continue to do what his masters say at the Brookings Institute and follow the plan of regime change. 
So besides the surface-to-air missiles we are just talking about on the Turkish-Syrian border, it says here they're protecting them from Syrian missiles that could carry chemical weapons. Remember chemical weapons in Hezbollah? Remember that. It's, that's what it's going to come down to eventually, probably. Hezbollah and chemical weapons that probably don't exist or not being used. And if they are being used, they're probably being used or being, uh, they have justification for their use. Remember, they don't even have to move them, the government. All they have to do is move them, or they don't even have to use them or fire them. All they, do, all they have to do is move them from the terrorists so they get out of their hands. Or if the terrorists, the rebels, uh, the Western-backed rebels, they get in their hands, well, then that's justification for them to basically uh, send almost 40,000 troops. That's what I've covered before. The Pentagon's actually drawn up plans. It would take about 40,000 troops to secure the chemical weapons. Western-backed terrorists in Syria are slaughtering Christians in a bombing, the latest bombing. Al-Qaeda terrorists backed, armed, and funded, and diplomatically recognized by the West have detonated two car bombs in a Christian Druze quarters in Damascus, killing dozens. Syrian hospital officials say the twin car bombs have killed at least 20 people uh, that are mostly loyal to President Assad. But, it says, immediately after the explosions, as the casualty figures began trickling in, the AP, Associated Press, owned by the Rothschilds uh, banking cartel uh, family, attempted to spin and downplay the act of the terrorism, claiming in a report twin car bombs killed 20 in Syria. It goes on and says, these egregious acts of terrorism aimed at Syria's civilian population by claiming those targeted were mostly loyal to President Assad has been a favorite tactic of the AP, BBC, CNN, Fox News, and others. In reality, the vast majority of Syrians, from Christians to Druze, from Shia Muslims to modern Sunnis, are targets of the sectarian extremists. Saudi, Wahhabi, indoctrinated terrorists, the U.S., Israel, and Saudi Arabia have been funding and importing from across the region against the Syrian people since 2007. The terrorists in Syria have recently received a boost by the West, arranging for them a political front in Doha, Qatar, or Qatar to act as the reasonable face for their armed terrorism, portraying the premeditated destabilization by foreign terrorists as an indigenous struggle for freedom and democracy. That's what they're always telling us. Oh, it's peaceful, right? The Arab Spring struggling for democracy. Well, it's being funded by dictatorships in Saudi Arabia and Qatar and that. Uh, it says here, oh yeah, well, the U.S. joined and began the humanitarian effort in Libya. But like we said, uh, this, uh, this Western oil puppet has already declared on Al Jazeera's intentions of establishing a theocracy or an Islamic state. Uh, Qatar's support for Islamists muddles his reputation as a neutral broker in the Mideast. So, yeah, really. For years, a tiny oil sheikdom of Qatar has been a reliable U.S. partner in the Middle East and as a host to a large American military base in the region and as a diplomatic bulwark against Iran, it has backed the fall of autocratic rulers in Libya and Syria. With billions of dollars in natural gas and oil revenue, it is bankrolling a new generation of Islamists across the Middle East. What is that what we call them? See, in America, we call them terrorists, right? Well, they call them Islamists uh, if they don't want to refer to them as terrorists because they're funding them will be bad if the U.S. was funding terrorism openly and publicly. I mean, people already know that openly, but uh, they're never going to, you know, come out and say, hey, yeah, we're funding terrorists. Uh, because then what? The U.S., the U.K., Israel, uh, most of the European Union, NATO countries would be uh, state sponsors of terror, like Turkey is right now, you know, and then they have to declare a war on terror on themselves. But uh, their biggest beef here is... Uh, is the raising questions about the vision for the region and whether some of its policies are in direct conflict with U.S. interests, right? They want, you know, their piece of the action. So that's what they care about. But they'll work with them, too. I mean, as long as it, um, you know, as long as it, it's in line with their global hegemony, uh, they'll serve their interests until they start butting heads and then, well, they'll declare them terrorists as well, a terrorist state of Qatar or Qatar and... Um, this is basically the same article. They just title it different. Uh, Tiny oil fiefdom uh, Qatar pushes for hegemony on a global stage. Then resource rapture Maliki al Maliki of Iraq moves to control Kurdistan's energy assets. So this is pretty much where we'll, we'll uh, continue when we come back in part three. The recent increase of Iraqi troops in resource-rich contested areas is fueling fears that the subsequent escalation of tension could develop into a full-scale war between the Shiite Iraqi government and the area known as Iraqi Kurdistan. This is what I've been uh, covering recently, the build-up, and then they kind of just uh, cooled down a little bit. It was over uh, Kurdistan basically trying to, uh, it was about oil, they wanted to start selling and producing and exporting their own oil. 
So if they're talking about Iraqis encroachment onto Kirkuk and threatening war should it continue with its current aggressive policy. This is GGN. Thanks.